Welcome back everybody! <clears throat> this is not a Malazan video, this is me talking about The Black Company, book one of The Black Company, or The Chronicles of The Black Company, by Glenn Cook. And um, I've done this before, in a what to expect if you come there from Malazan, but I recently had that weird urge to reread it. Um, well, actually I needed something to listen to while I did my workout and I figured the Silmarillion was a bit too slow for that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I just went back to um, the Black Company and I figured I'll just have a bit of a ramble about it. So let's do this. And this one goes out to one of my Patreon backers, one of my patrons, that being Livia, the Malazan Potato Noob. She was my second backer. I'm incredibly thankful and I've already, you know, collabed with her recently on the Blue Jays channel. So. Go check that one out if you haven't read already. And uh, yeah, um, thank you, Olivia, and cheers. <sighs> All right, so let's go about this in the usual way. I talk about general stuff. Um, and when I come to a point where I maybe will discuss the plot a bit and it will get slightly spoilery, I'll let you know beforehand so you can then drop out if you haven't read the book yet or, um, you know, still stay with me if you don't mind spoilers. I will not actually spoil anything like major, I think, because that's sort of not the point of this. So, The Black Company has been out for a while. It's considered one of the classics of what you might call military fantasy in a way. The series started in 1984, has 11 books at this point, 10 being like that main sequence, and um, an 11th one, Port of Shadows, being released like, I don't know, four or five years ago, and it's a collection of like two or three novellas. I've read all of them at least once. I read the main series, I've read the main series for like, I don't know, either three or four times, I'm not quite sure. I've now started either on my fourth or fifth read through. Um, now it has obviously like, it, as I said, it is a staple that has been around for a while. And um, on the other hand, it has gathered a lot of like fame in a way among readers and fans of the Malazan Book of the Fallen because Steven Erickson has mentioned several times that um, it was one of the main influences on his writing, on his, you know, writing the Malazan world. So a lot of people who enjoy Malazan then pick up the uh, the Black Company, apparently. And they are quite different books. So a lot of people that are coming from a more modern fantasy background, from a more modern fantasy, or like a more literary, fan literary fantasy approach like Stephen Erickson has, may find getting into the Black Company quite jarring, I feel. Um, so I hope what I'm doing here today will maybe help set like expectations in the right way. And I just want to, you know, point out a few things that I think are great about this book and why I want to, um, you know, um, why I think a lot of people should read it or maybe will get something out of it. So that's sort of where I'm coming from here. So um, let's go into these like different things. All right. So um, uh, where does it start? I guess we'll best start um, with a bit of like a background. So the Black Company follows the um, exploits. It's a fantasy story. It follows the exploits of the eponymous Black Company. That being last of the free companies of Catawar, and that means they are a troop of mercenaries. They have been around for several hundred years, and their entire story sort of is kept in the annals of the Black Company. So one soldier is um, always the analyst and is writing, writing down the events and everything that happens around the company. And... Um, we, as readers, get excerpts 
from these annals. I mean, we get these annals written down in the case of the first book being The Black Company by a guy called Croker, um, the company's physician. <clears throat> so right away, we have this idea of this being a a first person narrative in a way, a probably unreliable narrative at the same time, because obviously it's told through Croker's eyes. And that means a lot of different things that are important to understand, I feel. Um, yes, first of all, it's unreliable. Second of all, um, the language is a very specific one. And uh, third of all, um, the worldview is a very specific one. And other aspects of that also come from this idea of this being a first person narrative that is obviously not fully reliable. So let's look at these in turn. The language, I feel, is the first thing to look at. The language is something that I feel a lot of people that come from a more modern fantasy background or more literary fantasy background um, might find odd at the beginning because with Glenn Cook's writing style, at least in the, this book, it kind of shifts all over the place, but he has a rather, um, I mean, he's not, you know, um, uh, opposed to using uh, metaphors and stuff like that. He has some really cool imagery, some really cool imagery in these books. And I really think that people give him uh, not enough credit for that. But on the other hand, this being a like tale told by someone who is at heart an average soldier. Well, he's a company physician, but still, you know, he's an average soldier. Um, it has a very wry, dry, almost sarcastic sense of humor to it, and it is often written in rather short sentences. So very different from, for example, the Malazan Book of the Fallen that has rather complex sentence structures and so forth. Glenn Cook doesn't do that, which, as I said, makes sense because this is a soldier telling his story. And when you look at something like the Malazan Book of the Fallen, um, language also shifts depending on what kind of viewpoint we have here like you know maybe one of those later ones where you have the point of view of one of the heavy marines or heavy infantry or marines or so forth you suddenly have these like shorter sentences as well but this is just this this is told by a by an average soldier um and i feel that is important to understand it also shifts over time when there's different analysts writing down the annals. Their writing style often is slightly different, which, you know, makes a lot of sense. Now, what else do I mean by this is an unreliable first person narrative? We come to the second big thing where um, uh, the black company is unique almost in a way at that point. It doesn't have proper world building, which <laughs> makes sense, right? It doesn't, <clears throat> because the point is, the um, the soldiers don't know everything about the world. They know things. They notice things that are important for them while they are traveling. They notice. Uh, they know some things about their past, but not that much. And they don't know that much about like actual like geography and stuff like that. So where we are used with like a more detached viewpoint or something like that in a lot of fantasy, modern fantasy, we. Um, um, of getting like a picture of a fully developed w uh, world, universe where things make sense and so forth. That's not what we get in the in the Black Company, because that's not how that world like presents itself to Croker, or the soldiers of the Black Company. And that can be irritating or at least um, jarring at first, because we don't know where it, we are. There's no maps of the place. We just learn that we go to that country of the Lady in the north. And that's about it. And then we, you know, there's very sparse description of like landscapes and shit like that, unless they are important for the actions. Like, yeah, we go into a forest, that's it. And then you just like, oh, it's, it's a forest, deal with it. <laughs> um, so there is that aspect that I feel a lot of people might find difficult. I just think that it helps of, uh, to think of it as this being Croker's point of view and he doesn't know more about the world. So there's that. The third aspect of that is once again um, that I feel comes mostly through that um, 
perspective, that first person narrative of this unreliable one. Um, and that is magic. Now the Black Company has a lot of magic in its world, but it's never explained. We only get descriptions of the effects and sometimes of how it looks when a sorcerer or wizard or whatever, uh, or a sorceress um, um, do magic. There's no rules ever explained, which makes sense because Croker doesn't understand magic. He just sees wizards doing weird things. So that makes a lot of sense. In that case, in, in all of this, like the world description of the world and um, the magic being like not the, the kind of holistic world building that we have come to expect in modern fantasy, I feel it is much closer to something like Book of the New Sun, where um, the main narrator, uh, Severian, also just <laughs> describes what he sees and never actually, you know, tries to put it in a larger frame unless it is important or he just remembers because, you know, Severin is not exactly uh, the smartest, uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer for a long <laughs> period of that book. Um, so, yeah, I feel that's sort of the way to go about understanding why there is a lot of, like, this weird um, lack of consistent world building and so forth going on in the Black Company that may come as a shock to someone who has... Who does not expect it? It's because those people writing down the story don't know any more about the world. They just figure it out as they go along. So yeah. Now let's look at the next thing that is important. The Black Company is a mercenary troop, right? They are hired by the person offering the most money and giving them the best contract. Morality doesn't come into that. In fact, they are working for what you might call the bad guys in this first book. <sighs> and this can be a little weird to start with. Because the Black Company still deals a lot of questions of morality all the time, but on a different level. Now, we have, like, we often are used to. Uh, this idea that in fantasy you have clear ideas of what is morally wrong and what is morally right and so forth. Now that has obviously, obviously shifted over the last couple of years with Grimdark, but even Grimdark kind of only works if you have that idea of there is such a thing as good and evil. At least you as the reader need to accept that, otherwise you, yeah, well just, you know, all the ideas of Grimdark kind of fall flat. Anyway, um, in this case, the level of morality is personal morality and questions of dignity and humanity um, and how those are um, negotiated every single day when you are a soldier fighting a war, which is important because, once again, Glenn Cook, as an author, was a Vietnam veteran and you can see clear um, um, uh, effects of that in this story. We are obviously, as I said before, we're talking about the, the grunts. We're talking about the average soldier on the ground. Yes, there exist commanders like the captain and the lieutenant, but we also don't see much of them. We mostly see the rank and file soldiers doing rank and file soldier stuff. And um, the daily questions of how to stay sane, how to keep some kind of shred of humanity or human decency while doing the things that are necessary in war. We, are, we also learn very early on that, you know, these like big questions of uh, wrong and right don't matter on the ground, where you have this idea that, yes, they are hired um, to fight for the, for the lady that is sort of the, um, the dark power that holds that entire empire under control. And they are fighting the rebels that are fighting for freedom. Which, you know, from far away would be, it would be pretty easy to see which side is good and which side is evil. But it isn't like that. Obviously, because on the ground, both sides commit atrocities. Everyone there commits atrocities. The question becomes more one of, like, the personal morality. Do you go and join a revenge killing or whatever? Have you fallen low enough to stoop to sexual abuse and so forth uh, to let off steam? Is that something you do? Those, like, moral questions that you face on the ground, which, you know, 
kind of makes sense. You can even read that entire book as something of a um, parallel or allegory or whatever for like American involvement in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, where you have them fighting at the side of one power in a foreign land and um, the other side being um, supposedly for freedom. Now, obviously that you know, metaphor doesn't really work that well, but you know, you have that idea that they are sort of on the outside of the actual question of the actual you know, country they're fighting for because there is no, they have no personal stake in saving that country. They don't need, they don't have that. Um, so yeah, there is that aspect to it that I feel is very important. The next thing is we see some pretty dark shit happening there um, that um, people then need to come to terms with. They, they witness atrocities, but they also commit atrocities. There's one scene where they just murder or kill, execute, whatever you want to call it, um, the some prisoners of war eh, because they can't take them with them, which will then obviously have psychological effects. And Cook doesn't shy away from these psychological effects. Another thing that he shows a lot of feels a lot like, like actual realistic like depiction of military stuff is the endless card games like those happen all the time every time someone has more than two minutes time they start breaking out cards and playing that abominable game called tonk in this which is some variant of like a card game i don't get the rules completely but you know that's how it works um so, um, yes, we get a, a very, like, accurate picture of how it is to, seems to be a, as a soldier, or mercenary in that case, on the ground. What to do, what not to do, to which depths not to stoop, and so forth. The other thing that we learn in here is that the mercenary army, as a mercenary army, tries to fight as little as possible. The idea is to not do fighting because fighting gets you killed. You don't want to get killed. You want to survive and win your victories as like easy as possible. So we get a lot of like, you know, these um, mercenaries coming up with clever tricks to set traps for enemies and so forth. Yes, I, I guess like another thing that is I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, right. Another huge thing that makes this book kind of unique for its time, I mean, is its, um, its setting. I mean, we don't see that much of the setting, but it, it feels very different from your average medieval European fantasy setting that has dominated for had dominated fantasy for a long time after like Lord of the Rings in a way and we don't see that here I mean yes the ladies country seems to be sort of kind of medieval but we we hear a lot about you know the jungles in the south there's obviously um, a lot of like people of color in the in, in the black company. Um, that just happens. It's just assumed um, um, at a time where we have a very, very Western look at, Western, almost European look at fantasy worlds and world building. Glenn Cook is pretty unique in his approach there. We also need, once again, to come back to that idea of average people. Yes, the black company are average human beings. And this cannot be overstated how important that was at the time because like all like almost all of fantasy that you see before that whether it's Tolkien whether it's your sword and sorcery um, pulp people of the like of Conan Fafford the Grey Mouser um, Elric of Melibane all of those are larger than life exceptional beings they inhabit different worlds but they're always above the crowd in a way yes they have captains of guards there's normal guardsmen there's normal soldiers and all of that stuff happening but we don't we don't even get a look into their minds i guess 
I mean, I guess the closest we come to that is maybe Beragond in uh, Minas Tirith in Lord of the Rings, but even he's sort of, like, special. And Cook is sort of probably one of the first, at least the first one who does it consistently, consistently to put actual average human beings with a lot of flaws and uh, weaknesses front and center of his book, of his books. And... I guess it cannot be overstated how influential that has been to just show that this is possible, right? That it is possible to make a fantasy story about average people trying to survive, and it is possible to actually sell that kind of story. Um, now, things have obviously changed since then. This is like, I guess, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is like, this is from 1984. This is 35 years old. The world has changed a lot since then. And while at least you have a lot of like female wizards, like warlocks, sorcerers, whatever you want to call them. And um, in, in this world already, there are not many um, fighting women or at that point. So gender roles are still a bit old fashioned for the time. But, you know, I take what I can get. At least there is some, you know, racial diversity there like different ethnicities in that black company. So that's cool. All right. I think I've kind of covered the spoiler-free stuff, mostly. Um, so let's look at um, the the plot to look at why that it may just be also very unique and interesting. And then we're going to wrap it up. So if you don't want to know about the plot yet... Um, I'm not going to do like big spoilers anyway, but if you want, don't want to know about the plot at all, this is your chance to uh, log out. All right. The plot. Now, obviously, the plot is slightly weird. Um, it starts off with the black company doing something rather ignoble and trying to figure out how to um, live with that will be a ongoing question and higher <laughs> then higher on with their new um, employer which all you know makes sense but then when we look at the <clears throat> at the actual plot happening in the book this once again rings a lot of like Vietnam because they are there to take uh, to put down the rebel and they're fighting one rear guard action after the other right they're not even though they win their battles, they still come very close to losing the war, which I guess is once again something that you, um, um, you know, I guess is close to the feeling that people like average, average soldiers in Vietnam, American soldiers in Vietnam, probably came close to because, you know, yeah, losing that war, even though you might fight your, win your individual battles. Um, so there's that. The ending of the story also, I guess, is, I guess, still interesting to look at because, yeah, it's a series. It's a series of wins that still like come to a final battle almost, and yeah, evil wins, evil triumphs in this world. At least, if you still think of the uh, of the lady as the tyrant that she is, as evil, and don't realize that you know. The rebels may just not be who they seem. So there's, you know, stuff in there that I felt was really cool. Um, I also really appreciate um, the character of Raven being the archetypal um, fantasy hero and still being a dickhead, an asshole, and doing, like, dumb shit. So we see that idea that... Um, being a pure individualist um, in the way that Raven is, not sharing information, not, you know, all these things, is not actually as heroic as it might look when you are part of a company, when you are part of a group of people. Then you need to work as a team, otherwise you'll have a lot of problems. So I feel that theme is one that also <laughs> comes across really strong within this, um, within this book. One thing that I really appreciate it. Another thing that I feel is important and interesting here is how um, the company 
gets drawn into <clears throat> intrigues of different, what you might call, generals, or in this case, the Taken. That, once again, I feel is an important aspect there that you, as like the lowly soldiers, um, uh, will always be pawns or tools in the power struggles of the hierarchy and the idea that no, as soon as you have some kind of hierarchy, you will have power struggles within that. That, I feel, is once again an important theme that the Black Company, the first Black Company book, has. That, I guess, that feeling of incompetence in the upper echelons of the power structure. Um, that, that, that this un incompetence and infighting is jeopardizing the actual the results on the ground and endangering lives human lives at the at the ground level this also is a very very important aspect of um of like military fantasy done right and i've said it before it's like something that you also see in the malazan book of the fawns this idea that yes your employers your generals your um commanders will most likely fuck up and then you will have to deal with the consequence, whether it's like active betrayal or just incompetence, is something that is like so key, uh, so close to like the actual core of military fantasy because it, I, it seems to be so close to military, the, the experience of military um, personnel on the ground level. All right, so um, let's wrap this up. <sighs> yes, The Black Company is a short book. It's a quick read once you accept the fact that the prose is the way it is because it is written by an average soldier. Um, it has some really interesting things to say on personal responsibility, personal morality, and keeping your dignity and human and humanity in a way through out a dangerous job that requires you to do horrible things. It is one of the first fantasy books that brings um, the average, normal, down-to-earth, simple person front and center. It offers a unique look at magic, because we haven't spoken about it that much, because we're going to come back to it, but you know, a lot of like illusion magic, a lot of fireworky, flashy magic used for comedic effect most of the time, actually. Also, it has scary magic. It has a unique look at magic that is never explained at all. It has a unique feel to its world, that world being much less standard European medieval fantasy than most things out at the time. And, yeah, it's just a really cool story to read. Um, yeah, I feel that wraps it up. I really enjoyed it once again. I got a lot out of it, even reading it for the fourth time now, or fifth, who knows. I'll certainly uh, continue with the next Black Company book really soon, so expect a video on that. Have you read The Black Company? Are you planning to pick it up? Um, did you have problems with it? Did you enjoy it? Let me know in the comments and um, yeah, I'll be looking forward to hearing from you. Until then, cheers.